So the first speaker today is uh, Andrea Bertozzi. She's a distinguished professor at UCLA. And she's going to talk about energy minimizing surface tension configurations for microparticles. And Thank you. Are we set? Yeah. So I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, is that visible? Can you see the screen? Seems to work fine, yeah. Excellent. Okay, so we'll start the talk. So thank you all for attending my talk. It's a pleasure to be speaking today. I am terribly sorry to not be there in person. I'm in Los Angeles and it's almost midnight here, but I'm uh, very pleased to give this talk. This, is, this talk is going to be as much about science as it is about mathematics. I'm going to discuss some very recent advances in nanotechnology and how um, some fundamental mathematics can play a role in understanding how these technology, how these technologies work, and also some of the open problems that might invite uh, some mathematicians, especially those at the interface between theory and computation, to play a role. This is work that we've been doing for several years. It's sponsored by the um, the Simons Foundation from my end through a math plus, the Math Plus X program and also um, by the National Science Foundation um, in the United States and NIH. Um, and this work has involved a direct collaboration between mathematicians and engineers. I have some pictures of some of the students and postdocs and the senior faculty over here on the left and the ones in, outlined by green are the mathematicians and the ones outlined in blue are the engineers and there's definitely some crossover there um, but it gives you an idea of the the range of people um, also quite a lot of young people who are have been involved in this program and who are now advancing in their careers after um, being involved in this program so um, without further ado, I'll go on a little bit to the science. Um, my primary engineering collaborator is Professor Dino DiCarlo from UCLA. He's in bioengineering. And both of us have secondary appointments in mechanical and aerospace engineering at UCLA. Okay, so now I need to introduce a little bit of the terminology. So we're looking at something that um, there have been a bunch of words floating around to describe these things. Sometimes they're referred to as drop carrier particles and sometimes they're referred to as nanovials. So what are they? They're essentially uh, very small particles that act like test tubes, only on a tiny scale. They can, uh, they can hold uniform microscale volumes of aqueous solution and they can be used for the analysis. And when I say analysis in this sentence, I mean um, chemical analysis or biological analysis of rare entities, for example, cells and molecules and cells that might be secreting um, substances. And so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we create these sub nanoliter compartments and the mathematics involved. And they, the, their ability to hold these sort of uniform volumes of fluid comes uh, directly from surface tension uh, being one of the very dominant effects physically on this scale and thus understanding uh, energy minimizing surface configurations for these particles is very important. And that of course brings in some, uh, you know, some real classical ma mathematics and in differential geometry and minimizing surfaces. Um, at the same time, uh, we want to look at how these particles interact. So there will be some statistical physics involved. Um, we wanna understand what happens when we try to mix them. And we also wanna understand some things about how some of these nanovials might form. So there are some kind of batch processes that we have involving, um, uh, something that we might call a, a 3D printing technology, but it's not 3D printing in the same, in the same sense of sort of tabletop uh, printing devices. This is a diff very different idea where we have co-flow of concentric streams and then um, 
the, there's a preliminary, preliminary, preliminarization, excuse me, step with UV light and also what is effectively like a cutting technique, like with a knife, also using things like UV light. Um, at the same time, there are other technologies that have been developed that were involved in modeling that involve phase separation. So I'm talking about things like Con Hilliard models um, for phase separation. And I'll show you a video of one of those examples. Um, and then when you have these kinds of tropical systems, you can contain very tiny amounts of liquid that may hold a single cell, um, which allows you to detect. See, the thing is that a cell, when it secretes chemicals into an aqueous environment, very quickly that chemical can can you know sort of be absorbed into the background fluid and it's and and it will be from a single cell you can only detect very trace amounts but if you have that cell um, compartmentalized in a small space that suddenly you can detect um, you know with a much larger dynamic range things like secreted materials and i'll show some examples of those um, then you can look at what happens when you have two types of particles that may interact um, and, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So I'm going to move to the next slide and I'm going to show you one such technology that was published a couple of years ago. This is from Dino's lab um, and these are amphiphilic particles. That means that the particles actually um, so they're concentric rings and you can see the colors here. So they, they look kind of like what in English we call washers. They're sort of flat and they have a hole in the middle and they can come in different morphologies. This is our cartoon of some of the different shapes that were manufactured. But you can see the general ideas that you have. So this, this sort of looks like an extrusion process, but it's not really that. It's what you have is you have concentric layers of different materials. And these materials kind of are, you know, the, there's a co-flow that, kind of, um, that kind of condenses all of these flows into a very, very tiny channel. Um, and then there's a UV light that causes the liquids to solidify and then a photo mask. And you can see that this is all done like with a periodic um, time varying function that basically acts like kind of a knife that just cuts these, these things. It's like having a long block of these co-centric uh, materials and then you cut them and then you'll have these what are called amphiphilic particles where the inside is hydrophilic so it'll trap water or any kind of aqueous solution the outside is hydrophobic um, and this is just one example of uh, one of these kind of nanoparticles and these are a pretty small scale they can you know the ones that we've looked at can range anywhere from say 50 microns to 100 or 200 microns so they're not like a one micron across although you know one can start to look at even smaller scales we want them at least for the examples that dino's lab has looked at professor de carlo they're interested right now in examples where they could hold a single cell so that's not really nanoscale it's more micro scale but nevertheless it's very small um, here's another kind of um, microparticle the same with the same kind of function. Um, this microparticle is there's a cartoon featured on a recent cover of the ACS Nano Journal. Um, that was a paper published by Dino's group. And here's a video of the process by which they're manufactured. So what you're looking at here in this video, this is really beautiful. Look very closely at each of these individual spheres. So these are spheres that are that start out as an aqueous solution that's a mixture of, of a polymer and a gel. And then the mixture is cooled from, you know, say 20 degrees, 22 degrees down to about four degrees slowly over, over the span of about 10 minutes. And what you see is phase separation. So these two aqueous phases start off completely well mixed. And let me play that movie again. You can, as they kind of travel on this conveyor belt, you can see the beautiful phase separation in, in each of these identically sized spheres. Now around the spheres is oil. So this, so that's an immiscible um, third fluid. So this is a th really a three phase problem, but the phase separation is happening with regard to two of the two aqueous phases inside the oil. And what you end up with are 
are larger spheres that trap smaller spheres. So the larger spheres are polymers and the smaller spheres are gel. And then there's some hydrodynamics that we believe is at least partially responsible for an asymmetry. So this, so the, the smaller sphere um, is moved sort of off center from the, from the center of symmetry of the larger sphere, um, which creates kind of an opening on one side. And that gives you this kind of, so if you can then remove the gel from the inside, you get this kind, these kinds of little pockets. Um, so that's one example. This design you can see um, a couple of years ago, um, Joe Jarrett was a student working in Dino's lab and he actually won um, a prize that is given to art and science. So this was, this is, uh, you know, it's, it's given for the artistic nature of the science. Um, and you can see um, the image here of these little nanovials. Each nanovial is dyed red and and, it, and each of these nanovials is holding, is sort of capturing um, identical volumes of water and that's dyed blue. And then there's a background oil that's black. So that's the color coding for this particular image here. Um, so I mentioned Partillion Bioscience on my front slide. That's an incubator company that was started at UCLA. Joe is now the president of that company. And the goal of the company is to democratize um, these kinds of nano scale, um, uh, you know, sort of assay problems with the idea that you can manufacture these things in bulk. They are very cheap to manufacture. You can sell them to, to people who do not have fancy microfluidic technologies and they can use them to do single cell analyses without having lots of fancy and expensive equipment. So that's the idea um, for Partillion. Um, and I'm not involved in the company, so full, I have no involvement. I'm not invested. I don't, I don't work with them. Um, but some of the basic science that we've done has proved to be helpful to this company. Um, and I'm here to talk about the math. So, but let me just show you some of the other cool things that you can do. So, you know, the idea is you have these little nanovials. Um, they can capture cells. You can coat them with certain quantities that help to get cells to adhere to them. Um, you can add um, you know, certain chemicals that, are, that, one, that can react and can um, you know, show up through various microscopy techniques. I just to remind everyone, these are, these are um, on a scale. Um, I think this is, I don't remember exactly how big this is, but it's on the scale of about 50 microns, I believe, and you can see um, that you can image, because of that, you can image them using standard optical microscopy, um, which, you know, for things on the nanoscale, you can't, but for this size, you can actually use microscopy. And these are, these um, sort of pockets, little pockets of different colors inside the cells are, inside the nanovials are actual cells. And, and one can measure um, uh, actual reactions going on and secretions coming from those cells. Um, so that can be very useful for, um, you know, lots of problems in biochemistry. Um, so um, this is a little bit more about some of the measurements that have been done um, already using these, uh, these devices. This is a paper that actually has now come out in print in ACS Nano very recently. Um, you can see again the, the close-up of the cells, but what's important to understand is the scale here. So this is an image under a microscope. Um, this is an image on the human scale. So this is a human hand wearing gloves um, that's holding a vial. And you can see there's a layer in the vial and inside that layer are many, many, many of these little particles on the order of 2 million of them in this. So that's the scale that we're talking about. So basically what they do is they, they put some of these particles in, they put in some oil, they put in the aqueous phase, they may include some cells. They use the oils that are non-reactive to the cells. And then they basically put a pipette in here and will, that will cause the mixing and it will cause the cells to go into these nanovials. It's a very low tech um, kind of idea. Um, so here's the pipetting phase. You can see, you can see that they do this for about a minute where the, the pipette goes in and kind of draws the material up and down. It's basically a way, it's just a simple way of mixing. There are other ways that you can mix. 
Um, and then you can start looking at, you know, what you get. You can start measuring things like, you know, um, the fact that you have sort of a uniform amount of fluid with the, micro with the simple microscopy measurements, we can um, try to estimate, um, you know, the, the volumes that are, that are enclosed by these things versus background, um, just free fluid droplets. So you can see um, this is histogram here, the fraction of these different materials. And here are the ones that the droplets that are stuck in the particles. And this is um, through pipetting, you get, get lots of satellite drops. So there's sort of a mixing phase. We have some math that I'm gonna talk about that explains um, why you see these peaks over here. Um, the other thing you can do is you can start looking at um, secretion of actual chemicals from cells inside these, inside these, uh, um, these nanovials, right? So here's a particular experiment that was done where you can see over time, um, this, is, uh, this is measuring uh, um, presence of this particular um, uh, antibody uh, coming from certain cells. And you can see over a time period of incubation, you get um, you start measuring the presence of this material in these cells. So that's uh, one thing that we can do with these things. Um, another thing that we can do is um, we could do sorting. We can recover these. They can also re they can also do some washing and phase separation. And also, um, with even though they're on such a small scale, they can. Um, uh, sort of help them self-organize to be oriented a certain way. Here's a, um, here's a, um, a 3D um, microscopy rendering showing that these nanovials are all kind of, um, you know, because of uh, uh, variations in the, um, in the density of this background material, they actually can sort of um, self-organize in a certain direction. Um, so it's, it's very low tech, but yet they're very, very useful and very reproducible. Um, so now what I'd like to do is I'd like to um, get a little bit away from the science, although this is a little more science, and I'd like to start talking about how mathematicians can be helpful in understanding this kind of technology. So here's another amphiphilic particle that has a different shape. It looks more like a, like a clip, um, you know, like a paper clip or something like that. It's literally a piece of material that's folded over on, on itself. The outer material in blue is hydrophobic. The inner, area, the inner material is hydrophilic. And then um, you would have a water aqueous solution hopefully trapped inside here. Um, but again, the same sort of pipetting effect is used. Um, here are some micro, my, microscope images of these um, particular tropicals. And you can see that um, fairly uniform um, bits of water are trapped in here, and this water happens to be dyed with fluorescent dye, and you can see that here, and you can see they all look fairly uniform. Um, this one is also made through a kind of um, sculpted precursor stream. In this case, there happen to be barriers, and the barriers cause, or at least help this, uh, the fabrication to generate this clip-like shape, but then they're also using um, uh, UV light and illumination to do cross-linking and cutting of these things. Um, you can also play with cutting in this direction here, which allows you basically to take this overall large shape here, and then you can play with putting a mask in different, in different locations. It gives you different morphologies. You can have these very short ones, you can have longer ones, you can have sort of intermediate shape ones. Um, and the shape of these particles can affect their ability to, um, to uh, hold sort of uniform size drops. You might wonder, for example, why, so in the case of the nanovial, it almost looks like a cup. You might expect it to do a good job of holding uniform volumes. Why would the clip work? Well, this was actually the first one that we worked with. We studied uh, mathematically because it was the first one that Dino's group invented. So around four or five years ago, Dino approached um, my lab. I had mentioned that I was looking for projects um, for our new Simons Award. And he came, he showed us this particular technology. And we thought, well, this looks like a great one to bring minimal surface configurations into an interesting area of nanotechnology or, or uh, at least microbiology. So um, here's the idea. So here's the taco shell, the amphiphilic 
sort of taco shell clip shape. And you can see that um, it's got these two materials. So we can start looking at uh, minimal surface energy configurations. Now this is fully 3D um, where we, you know, you could use, they are symmetric left, right. Um, and front to back, they're symmetric, but um, they're not axis symmetric. So you really have to do careful simulations that are fully three-dimensional. Um, we're not, we haven't done full fluid dynamics with these simulations. We've just done um, the minimal surface energy calculations. And you can see very interesting morphologies. If you, if you take a fixed amount of, of aqueous fluid and a background oil. So notice that this is not a trivial um, minimal surface energy uh, problem computationally because you've got two fluid phases and two solid phases and all of the possible combinations of, of surface tensions between these four different phases. So that's non-trivial. Um, and so to do these simulations and the, this was actually published, this work was published in ACS Nano in 2020 um, and the computational method that we used for computing these methods, these, um, these different shapes was actually um, largely um, taken from a paper, which is auction dynamics and a volume constrained MBO scheme that was published by um, my former student, um, Katerina Mercuriev, um, Matt Jacobs, who was a postdoc at UCLA and Salam Esadoglu at the University of Michigan. Um, and that's, uh, that uses an idea that actually is, goes back a couple of decades, the volume constraint, the auction dynamics and the volume constraint are fairly new for that method. But the MBO scheme is a very interesting idea and it's motivated by um, looking at the problem of motion by mean curvature. How do you solve for motion by mean curvature? Um, and rather than trying to do local calculations on free surfaces, what it does is it uses a global approach um, motivated by the Allen Kahn equation, which is a diffuse interface model. That's a PDE that is actually fairly simple to write down because it's literally just a heat equation plus a forcing term um, for the phase separation. Um, so it's a nonlinear PDE, but then when, for, for actually approximating the motion by mean curvature, you can use what's called the MBO reduction, which stands for Merriam and Benson Osher, um, who were the first to work out this, this idea. Um, so what one does is one takes the phase separation phase and one reduces it to a simple threshold dynamics, literally taking the two phases and rather than computing a gradient descent into a double well, what one does is literally just threshold and set all the points in space to be one of the two phases. So it becomes a binary solution. And then you solve the heat equations that introduces diffusion um, everywhere in space, and then you threshold again. So that was, so one can make that work for multi-class um, separation. And uh, that was the idea for getting these uh, energy minimizing surfaces. That's only part of the, the challenge because in 3D, um, you also need to worry about um, actually the actual computation of where the literally where the surface is. Remember, you're computing all of this on a 3D grid, right? That is, um, you know, that it, that is relatively fine a fine grid, but it's 3D, so you can't refine that much and have something that's computationally tractable. So you need a good way to do interpolation accurately to find the surface and to compute the surface area. So there are some challenges there. It's not as easy as you might think, but if you kind of put it all together, using especially with some of our postdocs who are very talented, um, Bao Wang did these calculations um, for our paper. Um, what you see is that you get this beautiful set of uh, minimal surfaces, depending on how much volume of fluid there is, right? So if there's only a small volume of the aqueous um, fluid, it'll just adhere to one of the insides of this clip. If you have a little bit more, you get a li liquid bridge um, because the two ends up here are slightly closer together. Then with a little more fluid, you can be trapped kind of in the bottom of this clip. And then, um, and then you, you know, you, as you increase, you get to sort of our, 
this, this value here, which is actually a local minimum on the energy volume graph, I'm going to get to that in a minute. Um, and then um, if you keep on increasing the volume of the aqueous phase, it just kind of expands out and bulges out. So once you, once you understand this, then you can start computing what is the total surface, surface energy of this entire system as a function of the volume of the aqueous phase. Now, if you had no, not, if you didn't have this, my, this uh, particle and you just had free fluid and oil, the free aqueous phase and oil, we all know that the minimal surface configuration is just gonna be a sphere. So there's an exact solution for the sphere and there's an exact solution for the sphere um, with surfactant where the surface energy is decreased by the surfactant. So both of those look like two thirds power curves and there's no local energy minimum. However, when we introduce one of these complicated amphiphilic shapes, what it gives us is this value here where we have a local energy minimum and that's this red one right here. So interestingly, this is very important because this is a minimizer that can be now used to exchange fluid with other um, particles. So you can take, for example, two of these particles and you can ask if I have a fixed amount of fluid and I can vary the volume on this axis here, then I wanna be able to, to split that fluid between two particles and I wanna do it in such a way so that the total surface area of the system is minimized. And you see a very interesting, like, you know, just naively, we might not expect this, but this is what you get. Um, so if you're, you know, so if you have very, very small amounts of fluid, um, you typically will have all of the fluid in one of these particles and none in the other. But then there's a range where they pretty much split symmetrically. Um, but then if you increase the total volume of the aqueous phase, you get an asymmetric splitting and it's very asymmetric. And in fact, what you see is that um, this lower curve here, which is the smaller volume of fluid, um, kind of settles into a fairly constant state. And then there, all the remaining fluid ends up in the other one, right? And so, and you can see this experimentally. So uh, even though these particles are being manufactured on the tiny scale, we can also in the lab, we can manufacture larger ones where we can actually do a hand experiment and we can actually, you know, with graph paper and so on, try to estimate pretty accurately how much volume is going into each of these two phases, just with a simple adiabatic kind of slow pulling of these particles apart. And we did that experiment many, many times actually in, in the math lab. We have a fluid, one of, we have two fluid dynamics labs in the math department at UCLA, and we did that experiment. And what you're seeing here in this graph are, there's two um, curves, there are, there are, um, there are uh, symbols and the symbols correspond to the experimental data shown here. And then there are dashed lines and those correspond to what we would expect from the mathematics, the computationally uh, measured mathematics of the minimal um, surface energy configuration. And so you see fairly good agreement here between the physical experiment and the mathematical theory. Okay, so that was, that was an interesting um, test. Um, and so we thought, well, we can do more because there are many, many different shapes we're interested in. In particular, there are several shapes like the Pertillian nanovials that are axisymmetric. When you have an axisymmetric particle, you can compute these minimal surface energy or these energy minimizing configurations much more accurately because you can exploit the axisymmetry and basically turn it into a one dimensional problem. Um, and, and then you can also prove, you can also prove, prove a lot more, uh, not necessarily due to axisymmetry actually, but when you have a lot of nice properties of these energy volume curves, you can prove a fair amount about what the um, energy minimizing configuration looks like. So this is work that we um, actually just published in the Journal of Engineering Math a few uh, months ago. That's with my student, Kyung Ha, um, and Joe DeRitt from Dino's lab and also with Dino. Um, and so this is bringing back some very classical mathematics just to um, give you some intuition. Um, this is not the problem we want to solve, but we first reviewed a classical problem, which is a liquid bridge between two parallel plates. 
Um, and that's a, that's a, that of course is seen all over the all over lots of problems in science and engineering. So imagine that you have two plates and you have a liquid bridge and you're looking at an energy minimizing configuration. There are two very well-known solutions. One is just a spherical cap. And as long as the volume doesn't get too big, you can have bigger, you can have bigger and bigger spherical caps until you hit the top plate. Um, some, someone once asked me, why didn't you consider a top-down symmetry with another spherical cap up here. And the reason why we didn't do that is because if we were to break, you can do that with any fraction, you know, ratio of volumes between the top and the bottom, and all of them will have larger surface area compared to the one where you have all of the liquid on one side. And since we're looking at the lowest energy um, configurations, we decided not to look at the ones where you split the drop between the top and the volume. The bottom, but you can also have um, these liquid bridges, and you can look at where the spherical cap and the liquid bridge intersect. So here's the energy of the system, here's the volume of fluid, and you can see that the spherical cap um, are these blue circles here, and the liquid bridge is, is over here, and you can see that there's a critical volume um, where you would be the, the lowest energy solution would cross over from the liquid bridge or from the spherical cap to the liquid bridge. So that's not the problem we wanna solve, but it gives us some intuition for what we should be looking for. So the actual problem we're interested in are energy volume curves for these, you know, sort of finite size microparticles. So here's our, um, here's our nano vial, that's our, our spherical shell. Um, we can also look at another configuration that's just a cylinder. These are pretty, cylinders are also pretty easy to manufacture based using some of the methods that I showed you. Now, each of these two shapes have, for the actual shape alone, will have an energy volume curve um, that, you know, they look fairly similar. Um, the, the cylinder's a little bit different because, um, as you shrink the volume to very low amounts, you'll get a solution that kind of adheres to the inside. We're not interested in that solution. We're interested in, in the one that is close to filling the whole cylinder and larger. We're not interested in tiny, tiny amounts of fluid. So we're really interested in this region here near the local minimum and then, um, you know, and then increasing from there. Okay, so those are two of the shapes we, we can, and you can calculate this, you know, almost analytically. Um, so, right, and so, um, right, and there's the liquid adhering to the size of the cylinder. So what's interesting is there are two critical volumes for each of these shapes um, for the sphere. Um, uh, so we call them V1 and V2. So as we, as we increase the volume, of uh, the aqueous phase in, trapped inside this particle, we see that um, there is a there is a volume. Um, there's a smallest volume where the the free surface just hits the edge of the opening here, um, and then there is a largest volume um, where the edge of the drop is still not not flowing outside of this, um, whoops, of this um, sharp edge here. And that, those are the V1 and the V2. Likewise, um, the cylinder has similar critical volumes. Um, you can see V1 is where you first touch the edge of the inside edge of the cylinder. And V2 is where you're bulging out. And if you increase at all beyond V2, you, the contact line is going to move from the edge, the inside edge. So those are the two critical volumes. Um, and we also did experiments for, with both of these shapes using an apparatus. And here's a CAD drawing of our apparatus in the lab. These are macro scale experiments. Um, there's graph paper and the graph paper squares are 6.35 millimeters. That might, that might look pretty small to you, like five millimeters is pretty small, but it's actually much bigger than these tropicals that we're interested in. Um, and it does allow us to do some calculations of the total volume in the two sides. Um, and this, some of this work was published last year in PhysRev E. Okay, so once we have these particles, we can start proving theorems and we can start making measurements and we can start drawing energy volume curves. So these are curves associated with 
the lowest energy solution, if you split it between two of these um, spheres or two of these cylinders. Um, and so, right, and so these, this is the theory here, and you can see V1 and V2. This is the total, vol this is um, the, the, so um, this is the volume um, axis, sorry, this is the total volume, and then you can see the volume in each of the, the two drops. There's a small one and a large one. That's what SNL refer to, and those two, two, two volumes sum up to the total volume on this axis. And so we actually have a theorem, which is that for two particle droplets splitting for sufficiently large total volume, the minimal energy configuration has the smaller volume between, literally between V1 and V2. And that's, you can see that here in the simulation as well, that it's this red curve for a sufficiently large volume. If you're out here, this red curve will stay between V1 and V2 for both the sphere and the cylinder. So this is actually a function of the, of the overall energy volume curve itself. We're not, you don't need axisymmetry to prove this result. You just need certain mathematical properties of the energy volume curve. And those happen to hold for these two particular particle types. Um, and then here's some data showing for large, for some of these larger volumes, you can see, um, yeah, there's some noise here, but you can see the actual volume measurements that we got. The sphere was a little tricky because that sphere is not as stable. That particle sometimes can disintegrate after a while. The cylinder was a little more stable, but you can see pretty good agreement between the what you know, what the energy, what the volume splitting looks like in the in the actual experiment, and what the math predicts. Okay, um, and then you can look at multiple particles. So eventually, you're going to want to have a lot of these things interacting with each other, um, and so you get some really nice results. So if if you have the energy volume curve concave in some in some interval, then at most one of the entries of your minimal configuration is in that region. If it's convex in a, in a closed interval, then all the entries um, um, of W are in, the, in this domain are equal to each other. That's kind of a classical um, convex uh, splitting, balance, you know, like if they're not equal, then you can minimize, you can make the energy smaller by making them equal. Um, and then for the energy volume curve satisfying a list of conditions that are satisfied by both the cylinder and the hollow sphere, then it turns out that for many of these particles and a large, sufficiently large amount of fluid, that the, the minimal surface energy configuration has um, N minus one, which is all the particles except for one of them, have um, volumes of the aqueous phase in this small range between V1 and, v and V2. Um, and then you have one that'll have the rest. So that's pretty cool. Um, and we do see that very much in the experiments. Um, right, and you, then you can start playing with some more, like you can ask what happens if you, so this is, these are two cylinders with exactly the same size. You can start playing with looking at heterogeneous size distribution of the particles and um, things start getting a little interesting with the theory versus experiment. We have some departures there that we can't fully explain. Um, and that leads to um, a very important and, and I think very important mathematical problem, which is that if you have some dynamic process that is minimum, that, you know, is decreasing the total surface area of whatever you're looking at, um, um, is it going to end up in a global energy minimizer or just a local energy minimizer? And the answer is it's not always going to be the global energy minimizer. And we have beautiful, beautiful examples from physics. So my favorite example is this, this example, which goes back several decades. This is a paper that was published in the Journal of Fluid Mechanics in 1992. Um, by these authors, and they basically were looking at a very simple problem of the two immiscible fluids and capillary breakup. So they were able to create a very long thread, um, and then they then they uh, they did this through a kind of a shearing effect, and then um, then they stopped the the uh, the um, they they stopped the mechanism that allowed the thread to extend and then they just let it relax under capillar capillarity. And so you expect the thread to break up. This is what a classic, what's called the Rayleigh instability in fluid mechanics. 
Some, and then something really beautiful happens. You, you get a neck that forms, but look, the neck actually, instead of breaking in the middle, and we're looking at experiment and simulation side by side, instead of breaking in the middle, it actually starts to, it starts to break at the same time on both sides of a satellite drop that forms. And then that satellite drop actually has necks that are formed with the outer drops and so on and so forth. And if you look up closely, look at this, this is unbelievable. You actually get a whole array of satellite drops that form. So each of these satellite drops is a perfect sphere. They're different sizes, but they're each a perfect sphere, right? Um, and we know darn well, we're mathematicians, we can calculate this. We know darn well, this is not the lowest energy configuration, right? The lowest energy configuration would have been two spheres and no more. You know, they would have, you know, assuming that you want to impose symmetry, you would just get two. Um, you wouldn't get this nested level of, of spheres. Why do we get this complex structure? We get this complex structure because there's, this is incompressible fluid dynamics. There's additional physics that, and additional constraints that happen during this surface evolution process. And you can contrast this with a different kind of surface evolution that minimizes surface area. Um, here's one that I've worked on, and this is surface diffusion. This is a fourth order uh, flow, right? It's a uh, it's motion by uh, um, it's motion by um, the the surface Laplacian of the mean curvature. So it's not motion by mean curvature. It's motion by surface. Laplacian of the mean curvature. So it's fourth order, we call it surface diffusion, but it's a local, it's a local, um, you know, so it's local dynamics. So the, the, the surface moves in a way that depends only on the local geometry of what it looks like at that point. Whereas this, this is an incompressible fluid. So you know, it has to be non-local because you feel the fluid move, the fluid that's moving in different areas is felt non-locally. That's just a, an effect of incompressibility, but we don't have that issue here with surface diffusion. And sure enough, if you take a very similar configuration here and you watch it try to break up, you don't get these satellite drops at all. Um, so here's a simple example. This is actually a well-known um, uh, uh, surface of constant, uh, constant mean curvature, that's called a Delaunay Del angeloid, and it's actually unstable to surface diffusion. But it actually is, uh, it's actually, in some sense, um, uh, an unstable shape that is, um, that is, uh, we can, that can be described as a pitchfork bifurcation in the surface diffusion uh, dynamics. Um, so this is something that I studied many years ago. Um, so here's a picture um, this is uh, kind of a phase diagram. So this is the this is the minimum radius of the of the uh, so so these shapes that we're interested in surface diffusion these are all um, these are all uh, um, steady state solutions of the equation. So the angeloid, which is a surface of constant curvature, under surface diffusion it doesn't move, but if you perturb it a little bit, it will change because it's unstable. So this is our angelitis. We're just this is just a diagram where this is the minimum radius of the of the steady state solution. The cylinders up here, the spheres down here, and here's the angelite. And if you perturb off of the angelite, depending on how you perturb it, you either go to the cylinder or the sphere. It happens to be in a in, on a length scale so that um, you actually can you actually have coexistence. For a short enough uh, period along the axis of symmetry for surface diffusion, you can have both the sphere and the cylinder coexisting as stable states. For a narrow band, and the angeloid is actually the unstable state that separates them. It's really beautiful. And you can actually, I did the simulation many, many years ago um, when I was still at Duke University. So you can start with the angeloid um, on a periodic box and you could kick it a little bit in one direction and it will relax to the cylinder. Um, this is just, you know, a cross section. Um, you can kick it in the other direction, it'll pinch off in finite time, it'll break up into, and then you follow the breakup past that initial pinch off, and it actually forms two spheres, no satellite droplets at all, right? So these are two, so I'm talking about two different dynamics that both are, are decreasing your surface area, um, and they do it in very different ways. So we don't actually know, 
exactly what's going to happen without doing some direct numerical simulation or generating more theory for the problem with the microparticles. We have to make some educated guesses here. So what we did was we made an educated guess and we said, let's just assume that um, for the surface area minimizing problem that the fluid exchange is going to, you know, hopefully will do, do the best it can to decrease the, sur the total surface area of the system of, of Inter interacting particles as much as possible. So if you make that assumption, which is a big assumption, it's probably not always true, but still you can, tr you can try it and see, and then you can do some more math. So there's some more math that you can do under that assumption. And you can assume that, um, uh, so, so for example, we know we'll get an asymmetric breakup with the fluid exchange just because we have a lower surface energy if we do it that way for large enough fluid. Then you can look at the statistics of many pairwise interactions of these drop carrier particles that exchange fluid. So for example, when they're doing the pipetting, they don't know how long they should pipette. They're doing it for a minute. That might, not, that might be more than they need. Um, and then we can basically, so we ask this question as a statistical physics question, how many independent random interactions do you need between pairwise interactions of these particles um, to reach uh, this minimal energy configuration? Um, and this was work, actually a lot of this work was done by one of our very talented undergraduates, Ryan Dew, who is now um, at the Quran Institute as a graduate student. Um, we have a really good class in probability. And so one can actually use some pretty well-known um, formulas from probability to get the probability distribution of the number of independent random interactions you need. Um, and you can do it for uniform size uh, cylindrical drop carrier particles, or you can look at a combination of different sizes um, here's an idea, just some of the ideas from the math. We have some conditions under which these drop carrier particles, particles are what we call admissible. Um, the ones that we've looked at experimentally satisfy this condition and with a sufficiently large total volume, um, then the total number of independent interactions is actually a random variable that follows some geometric distribution. So you can actually work out an exact formula for this where XI denotes the number of independent random interactions until the system makes a successful change of state from I, from I number of filled drop, droplet tropicals to I plus one. Um, a, system, a system with I filled and N minus one empty tropicals has N minus I possible pairs that can change state out of the total of N plus one choose two possible interactions. Um, so you can kind of work it out and get yourself a formula. Um, we haven't actually compared this formula to experimental data um, because we haven't come up with an experimental protocol that would be really good for comparing, but at least we have a theory that we can look at. Um, and, this, and this theory is um, related to a somewhat classical problem in probability called the coupon collector's problem. Um, and I just pu I put this graph up here because I wanted to just mention that a sufficiently large total volume means you're, you're over on this end of the range. You're not down in this region over here. You're, you're over on the far end for either the sphere or the cylinder. Um, and then you can do things, so you can play with it and you can say, um, so, okay, I have um, a mixture, maybe I have a heterogeneous mixture of some larger ones and some smaller particles, is there sort of an optimal, um, you know, if I want to minimize the number of independent random interactions to really get this system mixed, um, how many large particles do I need to put in a um, batch of say 300 small particles? And you actually can find uh, minimi a minimizer, at least numerically for that problem. So you can, you can kind of have fun with this. Um, we, we have gone far past what the experiments have have done at this point in our paper, but it's, but you know, you can see that there's a lot of interesting math that you can do and there's probability and there's geometry and there's um, numerical analysis and PDE and all, all sorts of fun things. Um, where we are today, um, one of the problems that we're, we're kind of working on is um, direct numerical simulation of um, some of these complex um, amphiphilic particles that have been created in the lab. And you can see, 
um, you know, the aqueous phase that's trapped inside these interesting shapes. And um, you can see the experiments here that are shown under microscope and some of the um, direct numerical simulations. And you can see also direct numerical simulation of the drop, drop splitting. Um, the splitting does look a little bit different if you, you know, shear it, pull it apart off center. Um, this is sort of ongoing work in, in, uh, in my group with some of the postdocs when um, Lee did this, these calculations. And given that I am um, getting close to the end of my time, I'm looking at my clock here, I guess I'm about 50 minutes, so it's probably a good time to stop and see if there are questions. Okay. Sorry, my microphone switched off. So do we have questions from the audience? Uh, not many. I have one question. Uh, sure. That's what you talked about at the end. The main question you're focusing on is you have many particles and you want the global configuration, the global way you split your volume across the particles is optimal. Uh, did you also consider locally for a single for a single droplet uh, whether this configuration is at the global maximum given its particular volume, and how uh, studying the profile of energy can really guide the experimental process to guide the actual? It's a really good question. So uh, well, can I, let me go back to my slides again. I'll share the screen again. Um, where did they go? Here they are. Yeah, that's a really good question. So if we look at it, so the single particle actually really does, it tells you some things, but it turns out that having a system makes all the difference. So it's really interesting. So if I have a single particle, I'm not going to, I'm not going to see, you see one, one of these particles, I'm not going to typically going to see that um, for, for just one particle by itself. You really need the system. So why is that? Um, that's because, uh, and I don't have a picture of this. Okay, let me go, let me try to explain it. This, it's, you know, it took us a little while to get our heads around this, right? Because, you know, the, the obvious thing to do as a mathematician is exactly the, so the question you asked is exactly what I would expect a mathematician to ask. And the mathematician would do like this kind of a calculation. They would say, okay, well, if I try different volumes, sure, there's going to be one volume that you know finds this local energy minimum, but it doesn't tell you like you don't like you could have any volume you want, right? I mean, I can figure out the configuration for different amounts of fluid. So why would I somehow prefer this state? And the reason is that you don't necessarily prefer that state if you're just one one of these particles. It's when you have many of them together, right? And that's where you see that's so it, you have to have a lot of them. I guess is what I'm saying. If you have many of them together, this is really this is something that is not at all obvious, but it's provable. If I have many of them together, then then the minimal energy state suddenly becomes something very different. It, what you find is that n minus one of the particles will basically see this state right here, and that last particle will have all the rest of the fluid. And it's not at all, it's not at all obvious just like from uh, without, you know, without sort of thinking about it a little bit hard, right? It's not at all obvious why that is, but it's provable that that is the case. And that's exactly what we see. And that's exactly the, the principle that's needed for these things to have any sort of utility, um, you know, the, with the functions that are, that were, that they're using them for today. Is that, was that clear? Yes, thanks. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and that's why, that's why we've got, like, so the first thing we did once we did this, we're like, well, this doesn't really tell us anything. But when you start looking at two, not one particle, but two particles, right? Already with two particles, you can see that there's this asymmetry. And one of them ends up in this nice range here, and the other one gets, you know, huge, right? So then you do three. And if you put three particles together, two of them will be in this range and that third one will end up up here. And if you have four of them, then three will be in this range down here and the fourth one will have the rest. You see what, you know, and just, and you, you know, and, it, and it's kind of recursive. You can continue to prove this result for as many particles as you want to. And it really holds up in, in practice, which is quite remarkable actually. All right, 
Really good question. In fact, it's probably the most fundamental question. So, you know, and, and the math here is not terribly advanced. I mean, there is some convex, you know, optimization that's, that's done, but I would say that's, you know, and, and some calculus, right? And a little, and there, of course, when you do fully 3D minimal surfaces, then you have to get a little bit more sophisticated, but, um, you know, the math is not that hard actually. Um, but, but it's very pretty and it, and it has a, a direct connection to the biology and the engineering. Okay, so thanks again. Very nice sure. Talk. Yep. Okay, thank you very much. Lovely to see everybody. Have a good week.